Hello students, it's Mr. Sagers back with another video for Earth and Space Science. Today's topic is Earth's interior. By the end of this video, you should be able to develop a model for the Earth's interior, as well as use that model to be able to describe how matter and energy cycle with inside our planet. Let's get to it. If you're paying close attention, you may have noticed that Earth's surface is constantly changing. Some of these changes can be quite slow and are often difficult to detect. For example, the Himalayan mountain range grows at a snail's pace as it continues to rise into the atmosphere at a rate of only about a centimeter per year. Earth's seven land masses, which we call continents, also slowly inch their way about the Earth's surface at an undetectably slow pace. Even so, the North American continent will move a whole two meters to the southwest during your lifetime. Other changes occur much more quickly and are readily observable. Earthquakes rock entire cities and can cause billions of dollars of damage in just a few seconds. Volcanoes too can explode in the violent blink of an eye. Each of these phenomena, although occurring on Earth's surface, can trace their origins to processes deep inside the planet. What are these processes? Where does the energy that drives them come from? To answer these and other questions, we must first take a deep dive into the very heart of our planet. The Earth can be thought of as having four distinct layers, each with different chemical and physical properties. These layers include the inner core, the outer core, the mantle, and the crust. The Earth's inner core is a hot, dense ball of metal at the center of our planet. Although the core is mostly made of iron, lesser amounts of other heavy elements such as nickel and uranium are also present. Its diameter is approximately 1500 miles across and boasts a temperature of over 9000 degrees Fahrenheit. Although this temperature is well above the melting point of iron, curiously Earth's inner core remains solid. The reason for this is due to the pressure laid upon the inner core by the weight of all of the other layers atop it. This pressure prevents iron in the Earth's inner core from ever melting, as its atoms are too densely packed together to ever phase into a liquid state. Earth's outer core forms a shell around the inner core and is also comprised of heavy and dense metals. A major distinction between the outer core and the inner core, however, is that the iron atoms of the outer core are liquefied. The violent churning of liquid iron in the outer core gives rise to and sustains Earth's magnetic field, but more on that a bit later. Temperatures in the outer core are also extremely hot and range from 8,000 to over 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The outer core is just over 1,300 miles thick and acts as a bridge that allows energy from the inner core to expand outward to the mantle. At over 1,800 miles thick, the mantle represents Earth's largest layer and comprises 84% of Earth's total volume. It forms a shell around Earth's hot core and spans the distance from the core to Earth's thin crust. Unlike the core layers, however, rocks that make up the mantle are not metallic but rather silicates, or minerals comprised mostly of silicon and oxygen. Because of the thickness of the mantle, temperatures vary greatly depending upon depth. Near the Earth's crust, the mantle may be just 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, while closer to the core, temperatures are much greater. The mantle can be further subdivided into two distinctive zones, the lower mantle and the upper mantle. The lower mantle, or mesosphere, is solid and quite rigid, owing to the high pressure imposed by the rock layers above it. The upper mantle, or asthenosphere, is more plastic in nature. This means that, while still solid, it possesses the ability to stretch and deform under stress, almost like putty. This plastic nature of the upper mantle allows heat to transfer from Earth's interior to its surface, and helps explain why continents move, volcanoes erupt, and earthquakes regularly shake the Earth's crust. Sometimes called the lithosphere, Earth's crust is its outermost shell and is the layer on which we and all other living things exist. Earth's crust is solid, completely rigid, and is only 40 miles deep at its thickest. Sitting atop the upper mantle, Earth's crust is broken into what can be thought of as floating puzzle pieces known as tectonic plates. These tectonic plates often move in response to the changing and deforming nature of the plastic upper mantle. The movement of these plates results in phenomena such as earthquakes and volcanoes, which are most common at boundaries between tectonic plates. In addition, there are two types of crust, oceanic crust and continental crust. Oceanic crust is generally thinner than continental crust and is comprised primarily of the dense igneous rock known as basalt. As the name suggests, oceanic crust can be found in Earth's ocean basins. Continental crust, on the other hand, is thicker than oceanic crust and is comprised mostly of the less dense igneous rock known as granite. 
Earth's seven landmasses, known as continents, are made of this type of crust. Although we're most familiar with surface phenomena such as earthquakes and volcanoes, it's really Earth's core that is the beating heart of our planet. Energy radiates outward in every direction from the core and brings the rest of Earth's geosphere to life. Early in the Earth's formation, the planet was a mostly molten ball of superheated material. Because the Earth was not solid during this time, the more heavy and dense material sank under the force of gravity into the molten mass. They ultimately settled at the Earth's core. For this reason, Earth's most dense elements, iron, nickel, uranium, and other heavy metals, for example, are found in great abundance in the core. Much of the core's energy today is actually leftover heat from Earth's formation, as these elements sank into the core four and a half billion years ago. In addition, the radioactive decay of unstable elements such as uranium, thorium, and potassium contribute to the superheating of the core. The process of radioactive decay results as unstable atoms split apart and, in so doing, release violent amounts of energy. This energy then gets radiated outward. The radioactive decay of heavy elements continues to heat the core to this day. Scientists are unsure about the exact quantity of radioactive material in the Earth's core, but estimates suggest that there are enough radioactive elements to continue superheating the core for many billions of years to come. As heat from Earth's interior radiates outward, it passes through the molten outer core and transfers into the mantle. Once in the mantle, the heat generates movement of material in patterns known as convection currents. A convection current results from the rising of hot matter as it displaces the cooler matter around it. Meanwhile, the cooler matter sinks downward, taking the place of the rising heated matter. In liquids and gases, hot matter rises because atoms in the heated material are less dense than the colder atoms of the surrounding material. Although the mantle is mostly solid, convection currents still influence the movement of matter because of the mantle's plastic nature. These convection currents represent a very slow process inside the Earth, and energy and matter may take hundreds of millions of years to cycle from deep inside the mantle to the Earth's crust and then back downward again. At this point, you may be wondering how we know anything about the Earth's interior given that no one's ever actually seen it. As it turns out, the evidence needed to learn about the Earth's interior is easier to gather than you might think. Have you ever used a compass? If so, you know that a compass's needle always points towards the north and is evidence of Earth's magnetic field, and by extension the molten nature of Earth's iron-rich outer core. Furthermore, some of the superheated material from Earth's interior occasionally works its way towards the surface through volcanic activity. Volcanoes form when heated material within the mantle rises through the crust to the Earth's surface. Geologists can then study lava from these volcanic extrusions to get an idea of the nature and types of material found inside the Earth. In addition, scientists track the movement of Earth's tectonic plates, thus gaining clues as to what may be happening in the layers beneath the crust. The very fact that the crust moves provides evidence that the upper mantle is not rigidly solid, but rather malleable and plastic in nature. Tectonic plates that move at a faster or slower rate can indicate locations inside the Earth's mantle where energy and stress have built up, as well as regions where that energy and stress are being released. Sometimes, when large amounts of energy are released, tectonic plates grind together violently, resulting in phenomena known as earthquakes. Earthquakes send shockwaves, known as seismic waves, throughout the planet. Scientists can detect the arrival and nature of these waves using instruments called seismometers. Like x-rays passing through your body, these seismic waves travel through the planet and are used by scientists to piece together an accurate picture of Earth's interior. Say, for example, an earthquake occurs at point A on Earth's crust. As the earthquake occurs, it sends seismic waves throughout the planet. An interesting property of waves is that they behave differently as they travel through different materials. Some waves, for instance, only travel through solid materials and cannot pass through liquids. Other waves travel at different speeds depending upon the density and temperature of the material through which they propagate. Primary waves, or P waves, travel on a rather direct path as they propagate away from the earthquake's epicenter. Once they reach the liquid outer core, however, they behave in a strange manner as they bend and twist through the molten iron material. This results in regions known as P-wave shadow zones, in which the seismic waves are not detected by seismometers within those shadow zones on Earth's surface. Secondary waves, or S-waves, also travel away from the epicenter but are unable to travel through liquid. They die out, therefore, when they reach the Earth's liquid outer core. Were it not for Earth's liquid outer core, the S-waves would be detected all around the planet. Instead, the outer core creates a large S-wave shadow zone on the opposite side of the planet from where the earthquake originates. Scientists track the rate at which seismic waves travel and can thus determine the density and temperature of materials inside the Earth's mantle and core layers. 
By piecing together these clues from seismic wave data, scientists have developed a rather accurate model for Earth's interior that allows them to determine the composition, thickness, and even temperature of the materials that make up the inside of our planet. So to recap, Earth's interior is comprised of four layers, the inner and outer cores, the mantle, and the crust. These layers are distinguished by their different chemical and physical properties with the densest layers at the Earth's center. Earth's internal heat is generated by the radioactive decay of unstable elements, as well as from residual heat from the Earth's formation. This energy drives convection currents that cycle matter within the Earth's mantle and drive processes on the Earth's surface. And scientists use a variety of means, including seismic wave data, to study the interior of our planet. Well, that wraps up our video on the Earth's interior. I hope you enjoyed it and look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, Ad Astra.